the purpose of my talk is to think about faculty diversity from a multi-sector approach and think about it as not only the pipeline, but that other sectors contribute to the issues we have had for a very long time. I'll walk you through the, the logic of my talk in just a, a bit. But one thing that Vice Provost Haynes said to me on our um, get to know you conversation a few weeks back was that the prison system in California is really the 11th UC campus. And that stayed with me. It will stay with me forever, and it should actually stay with all of us forever. So um, when we can no longer say that that's something that's potentially true, I think then we'll feel like we made some progress. So the way I'm gonna talk about this is, is really, because I understand there's different um, sort of levels of awareness on the legal issues around the affirmative action case, um, as there usually is if I were, um, lecturing to a bunch of lawyers would probably just throw me out of, out of the room, but hopefully there's not too many lawyers <laughs> in here. Um, and so I'll talk about how we got here, and first with some demographics on the educational equity outcomes in California. I'll take you to some of, through some of the key legal cases and policy structures that got us here. I'll move into then uh, how do we get somewhere better with what we have and by what we have, I mean your state context and your organizational resources. I was recently um, invited to provide discussion comments on a National Academy's report on advancing uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in STEM. And one of the things I didn't see in that report was state policy. So I just wanna emphasize how important it is to know your context, your legal context, because we have a lot of people outside of the nation promoting very good ideas that are virtually impossible in certain states. And like I tell my students when I ask them to design an admissions plan, you can't use quotas, don't use quotas. Um, so knowing your context is very important. Also, why should we care about equity? It's bigger than just using race in college admissions. Frankly, thinking, I mean, the Supreme Court case in Texas is kind of the least of our worries because, well, as I told my husband, I may need another job unless you want me to get arrested um, or we're gonna get sued and lose everything or we're gonna have to fight back by improving voting and being innovative. So maybe we need one of these buildings <laughs> in Texas um, and creative. Finally, I'll suggest a framework that I've been working on uh, with a number of my colleagues across the nation for enhancing equity across organizational contexts. The reason I like this, and it's really about policymaking, equity and policymaking. We have come to this place where we have really great identification of the problem. Some really interesting solutions that can work, but they're not working. And so what I did with Institute of Higher Education Policy and these team of experts is, okay, let's get to the core of the how. Maybe the how and who's in the decision-making process, and every step of that is preventing some of these great solutions that could play a bigger role. Okay, so here are my key premises. A college degree is a representation, well, they're not mine, I noted who they are. This is Anthony Carnevale and colleagues. Representation of a synergy of long-term discrimination and privilege. We know that a college degree has intergenerational effects in their economic and educational influences, and there is this synergy that, that grows between the economic value of education and the sorting of housing values and what parents are able to provide based on where they live in Texas, especially with property taxes, that ends up being the strongest predictor of a child's educational attainment. So the main thing for me here is why are we providing educational solutions that only focus on schools when there are so many other key sectors that contribute to the inequality we can't seem to get away from. Number two is that educational sectors require multi-sector cooperation. 
And this is from the Federal Reserve Bank, okay? So it's not like, you know, your underground community organization, although they often have the best solutions too. I mean, when the Federal Reserve Bank is saying this, come on. So racial inequality is a complex web of inequities distributed and connected by systems that produce wealth, justice, health, housing, and education. And experts have noted that an improvement in one sector is not enough to effectively mitigate the overall level of racial wealth inequality. We're not gonna change inequality in schools if we can't address the other sectors that are contributing to this inequality, the maintenance of disadvantage and advantage. So based on these issues, I leave you with this thought before I get into the data. And I used to be an economic development specialist for the federal government, and so I tend to bring that thinking into my work, call it a bias or an advantage, but this is, and I think the data bears out. Um, educational equity is an economic development issue. It's a practice for increasing economic development of a location. The other part of that is not practicing equity costs money across not only sectors and businesses, but generations. So where are we as a nation? Uh, this is work I did with my graduate students at NYU, looking at more recent in terms of uh, using census data, the American Community Survey, the last, the, the five years between 15, 2015 and 2019. I know you all aren't surprised to see this, but the key message here, as you see, um, you see in terms of enrollment on the left, some up, very slight ups and downs on enrollment, um, you know, the Asian rate that's not disaggregated, so, you know, that has its problems. Uh, but it's, a top, it's the dotted blue line, the yellow line being whites. You have the orange and the green lines, the black and Latino, Latinos uh, superseding the black student enrollment, mostly because of numbers. I don't think it's really because, you know, we're doing anything all that much better, unfortunately, on average as a nation. And then the American Indian rate, um, as the lowest rate, and in fact, decreasing quite a bit and then coming back up. So then we look at the completion rate, virtually flat, it's 2006 to 2018. And so the key issue, I think the key finding here is what we're doing is just not working. And this is excluding adult arrival. So we took out all the, um, 15 and over students, uh, I'm sorry, 18 and over uh, students who came over from other countries who maybe, you know, it took them to, you know, it takes a little longer to get integrated uh, on average in school. So these are students who were here in the school system. And this is what we have. Now, state policy is a major predictor, as I just said, of opportunity and barriers. So we looked at this by state context, and I'll explain this hopefully so it won't be so murky. Let's start with the left gra the graph, which is the figure, the white Latino gap in uh, college success and uh, basically enrollment and completion. And pay attention to the zero. The zero, if, all, if, if the lines, dotted lines on the bottom, the closer they are to zero, that means the lower, the, the smaller the racial gap, right? And we did this by state. You see that Florida has a, the, the smallest racial gap between Latinos and whites, right? If you know about Florida, their Latino population on average tends to be Cuban or South American, have higher rates um, of income, have higher rates of education. A lot of the migration that comes in actually has, is more educated. And in fact, they earned more, earn, uh, higher earnings in their home countries before they came. So it's, it's a different group of Latinos. Who's the lowest? Let's, let's do that. That's Arizona. Arizona's doing pretty badly with the white Latino gap. They're the blue line at the bottom. California, Texas, somewhere in the middle, but California's kind of almost second in terms of a gap. So, um, you know, could be doing better, but hey, at least you're not Arizona. So, <laughs> you know, you got that going for you. Um, we'll look at um, BA attainment. Again, Florida also still in the white Latino gap. And on the bottom though, is California. 
And I'll show some other numbers, and this is what I'm going to leave with you, just from my assessment of the numbers. California has done a better job at enrollment in, than most states, but it's completion where this is the biggest gap to success. And some other numbers will also show that. If we look at the white-black gap, again, pay attention to the zero. Um, it's not the same picture with Florida being on top. I mean, they're not at the bottom, but with black enrollment, um, see, it looks like Florida by the yellow and um, California with the red are kind of near the top. Georgia's not doing too bad. And hey, at least you're not Illinois. Um, Illinois is, is in pretty bad shape right now with black enrollment. If we look at the white black gap, in college completion. Georgia is doing probably the best, followed by Florida, and California is at the bottom. So California, if we're talking about faculty, I think this college completion problem, if we have to think about where to invest, not that the other sectors don't, or areas of education don't deserve investment, but the numbers to me, if you have this goal of faculty diversity or even just the college degree to improve the economy, I think we're talking about a completion problem. And you all may disagree, but this is what the numbers tell me. I keep bringing up different sectors because I want to relate to you the inequality that begins at a, such a young, young age. And so these are what I call, this part of a new study I'm doing um, for the National Caucus of State uh, Hispanic Legislators. Um, and it's sort of, a, it's, it's a multi-state study, um, but I'm working on turning into a book to include uh, African Americans and American Indians. So in any case, let's start with just things like computer, internet, right, which we learned with the COVID uh, pandemic were extremely critical for even like maintaining some form of literacy. And teachers couldn't even teach because teachers didn't have access to broadband and had to teach from parking lots. I mean, the stories are outrageous. Um, or not able to teach at all. So if we, the American Indians um, is purple, the Asian broadly is red, green is black, white is um, maroon, I guess, and then blue is Latino. So on the no computer, you see that Latinos are really, uh, these are California numbers, by the way. Um, so I, I ran some new numbers just for this talk. So um, Latinos are the group most likely to not have a computer, the group most likely to not have internet. Um, American Indians are the group most likely to not have health insurance. And if we look at uh, some other figures I've running on health insurance in California, it's actually much better than other states, right? Texas turned down a bunch of money for health insurance uh, for kids, so they're, they're one of the worst, them and I think Mississippi um, and Georgia. But something's happening with the American Indian community that you know, it, shouldn't, it really shouldn't be this high given the state policy toward he health insurance in the state. Own a home, that's what own means. And we see that uh, Asians are much more likely to own a home than, um, than other groups, and the groups with less likely to own a home in California, which is again deeply, deeply tied to not only college enrollment, but college success, to be able to financially maintain someone in college. Uh, black students are the group least likely to own a home. And then we have so much more research on early, the long-term effects on early childhood programs. You know, that there, if, you, if you do an analysis just on test scores, you're gonna get negative results or it results that, that uh, peter out over time. But long-term effects have shown to be um, pretty robust with increased high school graduation and um, even college enrollment. And um, here um, you see that uh, American Indian, Latinos followed by blacks are the group most likely to not be enrolled in any 
early childhood program. So those are home contexts. This is what we're looking at. This is who is in the K through 12 classrooms. This one is just on Latinx, but I have the national rate uh, there below where it says national rates. So these are the states with bachelor's degree or higher, which would be like your immediate group to recruit from um, in terms of faculty. And here's the thing, California has, I think, I need to double check the number. Of these states examined, at least with Latinos, the biggest white Latino gap in BA degree or higher than all these states examined. And these are all high Latino states. Again, confirming that there's something happening with the completion rates in this state. Right? It's over, it's like a 20 point gap between Latinos with BA degrees are higher and whites with BA degrees are higher. The average Asian rate is higher. You see that the, the rate for black students is 21% as opposed to 17 for Latinos. American Indian is lower at 14%. These are the post-secondary outcomes in California. And I realize I'm using the census terms. I apologize if any of these are offensive to anyone. I'm just using the census terms data, but um, open to feedback on, on what to use. Um, I know in every state it's also different sometimes. So um, we look at by race, not in college, in college, college, any college degree, no BA, and BA or higher. And these are California numbers. So not in college, we see that American Indian, Native American have the highest not in college rates, followed by black and then Latino students. In college, um, we see that Asians have the highest rate, followed by whites, and the lowest is American Indian, uh, black, and then Latino. Any college degree, it does jump up um, a bit, uh, which this also includes college, community college degrees, and then no BA, and when you get into BA or higher, it starts to get quite stark with um, this, what's the 75 plus club, of not having a BA, blacks, Latinos, and uh, American Indian. Okay, so this is what we have in California. How did we get here? These are 2006 to 2019 numbers. This is, um, you know, a big part of this, uh, well, all this era, obviously, you're dealing with the ban on affirmative action. Um, part of it, you're also dealing with a ban on, um, Right, English bilingual education, it, which got re, uh, turned over, which uh, I was like, wow, look at that. Um, it also got turned over in Massachusetts. Um, so you're, these are, you're, you're dealing with some really rough policies in terms of helping the educational attainment of minority students. So how do we get here? I mean, these are states that have an initiative or referendum process. Um, and you Californians love your referenda. I mean, it's just, yeah. We don't have that in Texas. I don't know where we'd be if we had it, to be honest. So um, like I said, what do we do with what we have? And about 25 or more states have these referenda process. And so elimination of affirmative action has been, you know, through referenda or legislatures doing it or institutions just saying we're not doing it because it's not illegal in Texas, but Texas A&M, has long said, nope, not practicing race. And it's very clear in their numbers um, what the results has, have been. And uh, as of a few months ago or last month, um, the Texas Board of Regents and then the Board of Regents of Texas Tech, uh, Texas A&M, a number of others just said, oh, we're stopping all further development of diversity and race programs. So now um, all the major systems in Texas have stopped that um, as per the governor request and the region's decisions. So, well, I think the regions are chosen by the governor. So, this is how we begin to get here, right? The constitutional structure of what is viable in our state to either promote educational equity or induce barriers for educational equity. These are the cases related to affirmative action or race as a, as a uh, use in, um, as a factor of consideration in admissions. I'll talk broad, just uh, give you a little snapshot of how they relate together. 
But part of what we've been talking about as scholars is how do we get the youth involved or students to understand the relevance of affirmative action? And my thoughts are that, you know, a lot of students don't really understand, a lot of the public doesn't understand the role of this. It's just one factor, right? And But this legal decision can affect everything from hiring to um, how to do outreach and so forth, but it's not clicking with a lot of people and why it's important. What I've seen in Texas over the last month, uh, two months, and I went to the Capitol to testify as a private citizen, um, but they didn't start. <laughs> These students were there since 9 a.m. They didn't have the session until 9 p.m. and it went on until 1.30 in the morning. So, I mean, I'm old, I had to go home. But they stayed and they testified. And you know what's getting them organized? That they are going to this basically retract all DEI policies, and students are responding to that. They're saying, I would not be here without the role that DEI policies create in helping us feel more welcome. And it wasn't just about race. It was about gender. It was about sexual identity. It was about just being yourself. And this generation, I mean, they want to be themselves. And if you think about it, ending affirmative action is really an attack on DEI. And we haven't really promoted that message. But I'll tell you, those students were there lining up to testify, to protect. I mean, they were in tears. I saw you know, white students in tears. I saw gay students in tears. Like, it was, it was heartbreaking. And it didn't work. It didn't work on this committee anyway. There was only one vo uh, vote that went against this bill, the Senator Royce West, African American from Dallas. And it's now passed the Senate, and it's on its way to the House, and well, I may be calling some of y'all for a job. <laughs> so this is why part of what, how all this is connected um, is that similar to school desegregation, the early days of affirmative action was about an explicit societal goal to remedy past discrimination and expand opportunities. But then colleges and universities, the way they started applying race and admissions decisions at their own discretion, faced increasing resistance and more lawsuits, right? So there wasn't a lot of guidance. Um, and my colleagues in the audience have written about this quite a bit. Then came Justice Powell's decision with the Bakke case that says, okay, you can't use quotas, um, you can't use race as a key factor, but you can use it for the educational benefits of diversity. So you can only take it into account for admissions for the purpose of diversifying a student body because it has educational benefits. And as long as it's one, uh, one factor among many considered. So we have this reversal where past discrimination, past racial inequality, all of a sudden, let's pretend it doesn't exist because it doesn't matter, according to these justices. Racial inequality doesn't matter. That's who we were as a nation. But it's fine for colleges to use it because as we diversify, guess what? There are benefits to everyone. And there's like a, you know, many, many books now that say the more diverse teams you have, the more innovation, right? And a number of you know this and have written about it. There's, you know, there's more creativity. Heck, you make more money, <laughs> right? And, um, and there's been studies over and over on this. So what we've got into is the non-remedial goal of affirmative action policies, okay? As long as it's for diversity and educational benefits, that's okay. And so there's been a number of cases since, right? It started first with Plessy v. Ferguson, where the court at that time said, oh, it's totally constitutional to segregate by race because it's a matter of public policy. That's who we were as a nation. Then Sweat v. Painter, Sweat, who wanted to go to the University of Texas, challenged based on the um, separate principle, uh, the principle of separate but equal, and uh, the Supreme Court at that time struck it down, said, no, uh, you have to let this person in. Um, you can't put him in a classroom by themselves to learn. Like, that's what they were doing. Um, had this black student in a room by himself. Um, and they said that was unconstitutional. Then comes Brown v. Board, which was, um, you know, before the sort of the groundwork for Brown v. Board came from the Mendes case here in California, um, as many of you know. And it reverses Plessy. That's who we start becoming as a nation, right? That's a, 
and with Justice Thurgood Marshall on this court, appointed by LBJ, I believe. No, so no, that wouldn't have been right. Maybe Kennedy. I forget. Sorry. But in any case, that's when Brown v. Board starts to change who we're, what we're thinking about, and then things kind of just roll out on themselves until the Bakke case, which I just mentioned, where diversity is okay as long as it's narrowly tailored and it meets the educational benefits. Um, of a college or university or organization, so to speak. And then we have four cases, because there's two fishers, since the regents challenging the same principle. And in every case, the Supreme Court says you can use race as one factor of consideration in admissions, because there are educational benefits from diversity. Then come people like Jeff Milam and Mitchell Chang, Sylvia Hurtado, who like actually do studies that prove the research on educational benefits of diversity. So it gets upholded again in the Gratz and Gretter cases, at least that part. And then in Fisher v. Texas, Fisher 1, Fisher 2, that gets upheld again. And now we're back to challenging again. Like, OK, I just, anyway. Um, you know, my parents are, my mom is an immigrant. I uh, came, you know, raised on the American dream and on the, the value of the American legal system. You know, my brother's a lawyer. We all follow the law, believe me. But this idea that you keep challenging precedent over and over and over again, it's just somebody needs to write a book on that. So speaking of the research on why we should care about race and ethnic diversity on college campuses, Vice Provost Haynes talked about the demographic realities, where we're trying to get. But beyond that, there are national security interests. If you have a group, um, say, of soldiers, and this actually did happen, where all the officers were white and all the lower soldiers were of color, it's going to compromise national security. So the military is one of the first groups that said, you know, we can't have this. There's going to be no faith in the system. People are going to get killed. We've got to do this. Global competitiveness. They expect diversity now. So there are real national security interests in diversifying student bodies, companies, organizations. Then we get into, well, OK, so let's just do something that's race neutral, where we don't use race. Let's pretend it doesn't exist, and we're going to get the same outcomes. We do, I think we've done like 20 studies on race neutral effects comparing to um, the use of race as one factor of consideration. All the good ones, because there's a lot of bad ones. And here's the other thing. Be careful who you listen to, because there's a lot of people talking stuff that like, the research is so bad. It's embarrassing. But they get all this airtime. So one of the things I teach my students is learn to understand what is rigorous, appropriate research, qualitative and quantitative. Don't listen to someone just because they're being interviewed, right? And I'll stop there. Here's the bottom line. Race-neutral policies do not work. They are not working better than the use of race as one factor of consideration. State over state, national studies, it's so bad that Mark Long and colleagues, some economists at University of Washington, not only does it affect the state context when you ban affirmative action, it affects the larger region, Idaho, Washington, other places that no, Washington does have a, a ban. Other places that perhaps you could be recruiting from are also deciding not to come. Or people are not deciding to come to the, even the, the states nearby. So it's got this like evil filtering, <laughs> you know, the, what's the word? Um, not dissemination, it's like osmosis. I don't know. But anyway, it's bad and it's not just about your state, it's going over where. If you think not diversifying is bad, right? So the research is clear there, and I was on NPR, and I was like, look, this is what it is. This is, it's wrong, it, and it's not wrong. It doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. My husband was like, well, you were really cocky on there. <laughs> he, said, he said, you sounded so definitive. I was like, it is definitive, and I'm tired, to stop. I'm tired of trying to act like, well, let's look at the other side. No, all the research says this. Anyway, okay, so there's that. And then there's colorblind policies. We've tried that. Even conservative economists have shown that if you do a simple experiment of just efficiency, you lose creativity, you lose um, basically 
diversity in thought, you end up with a student body that is probably not the best representation of who you can be as a university. So colorblind policies, not effective. So again, to restate, if you have any, any sort of thoughts uh, or any uh, questions, and ed educational benefits of diversity, they're very positive benefits overall that go beyond like test scores and grades, but general like civic, um, friendships and so forth. And there are experts in the room who can talk about that better than I can. Race neutral admissions, uh, percent plans, they don't work as they're currently constructed. Here's the thing though, the Supreme Court will likely ban the use of affirmative action. And I bet, you know, 80% of universities are gonna be like, well, let's try that percent plan. Okay, but we're gonna have to be more creative because what we're doing now for percent plans in Texas, which is actually the most liberal, you guys have a real tough one. And so does Florida. I mean, kids don't get to go where they wanna go. That's a problem. Uh, but anyway, I'll leave that to Officer the President. Um, <laughs> In terms that Texas has the most liberal one and kids still aren't coming even though they are um, totally eligible and able to come. So if we're gonna revise percent plans, we need to think more creatively. And then bans on affirmative action is not just about what happens to your campus, it's about what happens to your state and your neighboring states. We had a lot of questions about critical mass, like having you know, not just two black students, but if you have 15 or 20, you might see the diversity in what is African origin from different global perspectives, from different states and so forth. And that way we don't create stereotypes. And you know, coming from this, I taught at uh, Vanderbilt, you know, grew up in Texas. And then when I went to NYU, it was the most beautiful thing. I had, I must have had like 10 black students in my classes from all types of countries and then mostly all types of states or children of immigrants from all kinds of countries. Don't you dare try to stereotype and think of that you know about one student just because their skin is dark compared to another. It was the most beautiful learning experience that I've had. Same thing with Latinos, right? I was like the only Ch Chicana. So, you know, I had to get to know what it meant for success for my students in New York City. Finally, you have um, work on mismatch, which we call Kurlander, who's one of our, one of your uh, premier researchers. She's, um, uh, she works at UC Davis, is sort of like the data empire queen, a uh, very good friend, incredible person. Her and Eric Grotsky have done some work on mismatch um, and disproved that. You know, this idea like, well, no, we're doing minority students bad if, if they go to a place they're not prepared for. Um, they should really go somewhere less selective. And I always thought, well, you know, you didn't care when I went to a crappy school with crappy teachers and now you care that I might be overreaching? Turns out the better institution you go to, the more likely you are able to um, graduate. And they disprove this hypothesis um, in their very rigorous papers. So how do we get somewhere better with what we have? I'm arguing that we have our, what I call, in my Catholic way, our come to Jesus talk or come to whomever you believe in talk and unpack these myths. Number one, that merit is an objective formula. There are components of merit that I think are um, very viable around you know, compared to certain, uh, in certain time frames, But if you read, um, I blanked on the sociologist right now, um, it'll come to me, but uh, this book on merit, um, it's been a very engineered, restructured process across time to benefit the people in power, right? So before it was like, are you, do you represent the American way, the characteristics? Are you a good American man? And, you know, you can imagine what that looked like at the time. So, uh, and then like it became test scores. And then, if you know, the history of Jewish students, they started out doing everyone. So then uh, test scores became less of an issue, became holistic admissions. Over time, merit has changed. Merit is socially constructed based on who's in power. There are clear components of being smart and academic achievement, 
but they're also social and power constructed components. Colorblind policy is efficient. Yes and no, but it certainly isn't the best approach. If you want to produce a line of decent Kroger products, HEB products, fine. But do you want to go there to only see that, right? I mean, that's a really shoddy example, but um, colorblind policy disrupts innovation. It just does. Finally, equity is just for the disadvantage. I'll talk a little bit about this in the next few slides. No, equity is actually, if you increase the number of college degrees in a, uh, in a community, it tends, what it does, it's a win for everyone. It increases wages, it increases, even for people with just a high school degree, it increases innovation, it increases jobs. There are real economic benefits from equity. And a lot of economists have found that it decreases crime, um, it increases the likelihood of going to college, there are major evidence-based advantages to equity. Discrimination, myth number four, is only affects the discriminated. There's a cost to discrimination. And the, the Citigroup, a uh, bunch of banks, just did a study that said discrimination against African Americans has cost the US $16 trillion. That's the price tag on how much the economy has lost as a result of discrimination against African Americans, $16 trillion. That doesn't even cover Latinos or Native Americans. To give you a, um, and I think the, the GDP is actually, for last year was actually 19.5 trillion, so that should give you scale. Acting not to reverse discrimination will continue to um, ex exact a cost. And Citigroup estimates that the economy would see a $5 trillion boost over the next five years if the U.S. were to tackle key areas of discrimination against African Americans. Now, maybe some people don't care about money, but a lot of people do. So, myth number five, increasing diversity in the faculty hiring is just about the pipeline. It's not. I used to be an associate dean for faculty development and diversity at NYU. I had some wonderful years there. I had a great boss who kind of just let me run with things, right? Um, and this is the thing. I had lots of protections. I had tenure. I was an expert in higher ed policy. And I wasn't afraid to speak up. And what were they going to do? Fire me and I go back to my fabulous job as a professor? OK. But I trusted this team or I trusted that they trusted my knowledge, and the dean's gonna do what he's gonna do, but I, was, I felt like I had a voice. I could say, hey, I think this is worth it. I think this is worth an investment, and he was an economist, so what I did is I just made sure to, to give him the economic perspective, and we usually got the funding that we needed. And, um, you know, it was just, it was about recruiting appropriately, sending lists back if they did not do their job in recruiting. We gave them a whole program. Recruit from Spencer, recruit from NSF, recruit from, go to the top 20 schools, contact the top 20 deans, contact the top 20 department chairs, send them letters, find out, make Zoom calls, get names, and send out recommendations. We gave them a whole organized structure to do. We always had way more applicants than we, time we wanted to spend reading, but we did it. And if it didn't look good, he sent it back. Try harder. Search is delayed until then. Now, we were a private institution, but um, we did that along with a what we called um, faculty first look. We had a special program for doctor students that were about to enter the faculty ranks and all kinds of education related, um, anything that related to the Steinhardt School, which was like from physical therapy to drama to education. And we brought in these students we helped them with their job talks. We talked about the realities of being minority faculty. Uh, we had three-day events for them. And you know, now I see them all over AERA as faculty members, working for foundations. Like these kids we brought in, we're not kids, they were adults already. I'm like, you know, I, I hope she remembers me because <laughs> she's got a great job at a foundation where um, I would like to pitch something. So it was a really beautiful program. 
And I think, you know, it was small scale, but imagine if everybody had something like that. Um, all right. Maybe you all know this, but I was on a, a, a what equity means, but go ahead and take time to read this definition. And the reason it's important is because I was on a National Academies report panel. Um, and you had all these equity experts in the room, and it took us a year to come up with the definition that we agreed with. Because everyone thought they knew what equity was. And, and you know, and I was there, well, what about the English learners? Or what about the immigrants? Or what about, you know, and so like, luckily I wasn't the only Latina there, but it, it became to be, no, you do not do anything without understanding that English learners are part of this equity matrix. Uh, Again, having tenure and being an expert in your field helps. And what are they gonna do, kick me out? I was following the rules. Um, so that was part of it. And again, so understanding that confronts conditions of inequality, addresses differences in educational starting points, and integrates the role of need in regard to resource and opportunity distribution. Now in STEM, this could be, this could be wider and include you know, US citizens, it could include uh, women, women of color, uh, minority serving institutions, and the Nash Kami has done more and more uh, reports on that. But whatever your context of inequality and your context of equity is, not only within your state, but within your organization, within your discipline, within your department. That's what I think is a better assessment. I've talked about the, and I've talked about the, um, the benefits to equity. I did this uh, brief for MDRC on, hey, come up with the top five solutions and problems for college success. I'm like, oh, okay, in five pages. <laughs> so that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever written because it really forced me to think about the pipeline. And so these are the four barriers I've thought about and no, it's not directly for faculty hiring, but guess what, if you don't attend to this, you're never gonna get to I think where you think you wanna to get to. So high academic preparation, barriers to this, teacher quality, and then segregation. In all my studies, when we look at the effect of race, uh, racial segregation, it's like the biggest culprit in uh, racial gaps. It's like the biggest evil of all the data elements. And we're not gonna fix racial segregation in schools with just education policy. Financial constraints, part of what's happening with the percent plan is that UT Austin still costs a lot of money and doesn't matter how smart you are, it's not just about paying my tuition, it's what are my opportunity costs for leaving my family to go do the privilege of college. And if you're first generation, that's a huge cost. And that's not a cost you can look your family in the face with unless you have better support. So being more creative about how to fund students, and in grad school too, especially grad school as well. Um, limited access to information. So many of our most innovative um, interventions, to, you know, by text and so forth, very few do it in different languages. Think about the cultural context. And then they wonder why there's no effect. Well, if 80% of your <laughs> school, uh, Students are minority, but you're doing interventions that fit white middle class uh, 18 to 24 year olds. You do not understand the status of college access in America. So thinking about the realities of demographic and cultural uh, differences as a country is very important. And then, um, you know, I work at, at the flagship. I've worked at private institutions. I've had a very privileged career. The UC is a very privileged system. What we're missing in terms of political lobbying and more support is the institutions that serve low-income students, community colleges, minority-serving institutions. So these are the solutions that, um, that you know, I suggested based on research. Alignment with teacher quality, because if we don't have good teachers, if we don't pay our teachers, I mean, it's, you guys know the teacher shortage as well. Um, it's gonna be hard to make courses more rigorous and schools more high quality. We cannot lose sight of equitable school integration and again, prioritizing colleges that serve low-income students. So part of how we operationalize this is really consider what are equity metrics and we have this report that I'm happy, uh, oh well there's the, uh, no that's, that's the MDRC brief but I can uh, 
send the link to the National Academy's report on how we constructed equity metrics based on the data systems that we have in this country. Creating high, uh, re re recruiting and retaining high quality educators, not only K through 12, but also post-secondary education that are demographically representative of their student population. There's more and more studies that show when you have that racial match, students are more likely to not be retained in K through 12 and persist in their higher education context. This doesn't mean white faculty can't mentor or help students that don't look like them. This doesn't mean that at all, let me be clear. But it does, the role model, model effect matters. There is something about that. And it's more than the help me feel good, you might look like me, understand kind of thing. There is something economically, socially, racially, organizationally happening there with voice that is helping persistence. And then a lot of people say this, but it's going to be illegal in Texas now, which is acknowledge and address the factors that have caused inequities in post-secondary education. Hopefully it won't be. But we can't find solutions if we don't understand the problem. So I wrote this paper with my students as well, thinking about what is opportunity enhancing in terms of state policies and what is opportunity constraining. And um, what it ends up happening is, do you have equity enhancing policies or equity enhancing outcomes or equity blocking outcomes? And we did this just for Latinos, but we found actually that states that have a higher number of Hispanic serving institutions the in-state resident tuition policies for undocumented students um, are actually more likely to graduate Latinos than states that do not have this. States that have con constraining policies are, are less likely to um, not graduate them. Okay, so how do we begin to do this? I pulled some recommendations from that National Academy's report on, that recently came out that I talked about on STEM. And these are some, some items that I think are helpful. It has a lot of helpful stuff. It is a very good report overall, except for the state policy part. But um, so I'm gonna show these, and then I'm gonna talk about the framework that uh, I did with my colleagues and Institution for Higher Education Policy. So this is for STEM, but it's really about gatekeepers at all kinds of organizations. And it doesn't just talk about presidents and so forth. It brings in directors of human resources offices um, and uh, right the department heads and so forth. So it goes beyond, the, it, it really thinks about all the structures of the organization. So they recommend that they can improve minoritized people's individual interpersonal experiences, the following practices. Include responsibilities related to advancing anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion in leadership role descriptions and requirements for advancement into management. Now that's gonna be legal in Texas. We're not gonna be able to have like your diversity statement, which we used at NYU and other places, but apparently that's not gonna be accepted anymore. Um, and the difference here with this report that it really adds, it's not just DEI anymore, it's anti-racism, which I thought was clever. I hadn't seen that before. Uh, Anti-racism, uh, like put together with DEI, but maybe I'm behind the time. So ADEI is what they're calling it. And then systems with more widely shared inclusive decision-making processes and shared authority over the allocation of resources, which should limit the negative consequences that occur when gatekeeping is concentrated and select with select individuals. Now, this is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way, but um, just something to think about. Some other recommendations, taking action to redress both individual bias and discrimination, as well as organizational processes that reproduce harm and negative outcomes from pe for people from minoritized racial and ethnic groups at critical points of access and advancement. New, it should require evaluation criteria, decision-making process to understand if and to what degree existing standards perpetuate underlying racial and ethnic inequities. One of the things I remember from an institution I was at is uh, there were hiring a faculty member who taught about um, trans student issues. 
and there was uh, some other faculty members who were writing about it very publicly uh, against it. And so, you know, it became a very interesting faculty meeting. So you're gonna have pushback, expect that pushback, but how is your organization gonna handle it, right? So they sent me in to sit at the meeting. I didn't always sit in on meetings, but I felt like the bad cop going in. And um, I just went in, I didn't say anything, I sat in the back. Anyway, it all went through fine. Um, leaders, managers, human resources departments, like I said, should anticipate resistance to anti-racism. Really, it's, it's more than resistance, frankly. If This is what I've learned over time. Uh, many of you probably know this. When you take one step forward, expect they're gonna bring you four steps back. Two steps forward, they're gonna bring you back three more steps. This, uh, it's a long-term fight, and vigilance of justice just can't end. One victory doesn't mean you're good. In fact, 10 victories doesn't mean you're good. Uh, here are some suggestions from National Academies. There's a lot of books out there on how to think about DEI, and they, this report is really good about giving you a reference list if you ever want to look into it. And, um, and so I can send that on as well. And so he, just here are some thoughts. Um, they tend to be not so much abstract, but like what we want to get to is, okay, so how do you do this? How do you begin to redesign the decision-making process? And this is the last part, which is increasing equity in policymaking, but it really is also about your general organization decision-making. And um, I'm not sure, I think you can see it hopefully. These are the scholars that participated in this uh, report construction. Um, you know, from uh, community colleges to a lot of practice organizations in higher ed, um, attorneys. So it was, it was a really good group, and we learned a lot from each other. Very multi-generational as well. So five principles, and here's the cheat sheet. How you frame the issue shapes the creation of the relevant policy. So frame an issue by including the specific why of the work and what of the problem. Applying an equity lens to outcomes, even for seemingly race-neutral problems. And reaching hearts and minds. I mean, a lot of people wanted to put that in. I wanted to put in reaching pocketbooks, but they wouldn't let me. So let's just say hearts and minds and pocketbooks. Where you invest signals priorities, uh, plan for long-term sustainable systemic change. You know, even like, let's say, hey, if you have an increase in test scores for one year, you've done your job. No, you sustain that. Or even if the test scores don't increase, guess what? Maybe the problem is so entrenched, the inequality is so deep, that test scores is actually not the way you should look at something. Um, and questions on sustainable systemic change. Who participates in policymaking decisions shapes the outcomes, right? Ensure the representation and voices of impacted communities. I mean, it's gotten better now, it has, but I can't tell you, even in more progressive administrations, where I was the only Latina on the White House table, twice, that's not okay. That's not okay when Latinos are now it's been 20 years since we are the largest minority in the nation. We are the largest minority in the, in the nation's largest school districts. But I'm the only one, or there's only one, maybe two Latinos at the table. And hey, I didn't even sign up to be the English learner person, but I am now because I have to be. And I want to be, my mom was a bilingual ed teacher, but that's, that's not what I saw at the forefront. But now, you know, and I cite Frances's work all the time. God bless her for writing these books. They are what she calls the brown paradox. The more Latinos we have, the worse the nation is starting to act against them. When we should be, you know, everyone loves tacos. But then we have this brown paradox. Okay, and then data. I won't, and I won't skimp on this, I won't negotiate on this, 
This, we need data, good empirical evidence for these policy decisions. Too many times people are just shouting out what they think will work without any evidence. It might take more time, but I used to work for the federal government. I used to be a congressional auditor. I worked for the General Accountability Office. I evaluated whether money was being spent appropriately, and that's the public's money. So no, I don't negotiate on that. I mean, there's sometimes you have to make quick decisions, but I don't believe in spending the public's money um, or not even designing it for the people you're supposed to be helping. And then finally, language must be precise, inclusive, people first, and respectful. You know, and it was our Native American scholar colleagues who were like, y'all need, we need Jesus. I mean, I said that to myself, but we needed some serious help understanding how to communicate with the Native American population and what we needed to learn from them. So the rest of this includes the key things about the principle. Uh, be explicit about inequity and injustice. If equity is not part of the issue, it'll likely be part of the result. And I see this a lot, right? It's like, y'all are aiming for equity, but you never designed the policy to have equitable effects. You didn't design the policy with understanding that there is inequity to be dealt with. So again, investment signals priorities, where you put the money matters, and uh, where you sustain the money shows your commitment even more. We need to be thoughtful about who's in the room. I already said that. It, this is like everybody knows this, but we don't do it enough. Like this is the easiest rule you can follow. But also don't, it's very, you know, consider that you be, if you have an organization with very few minorities, if you're gonna keep asking minorities to be part of this because you're trying to make this principle work, then reward them, take away other certain things, or pay them. And finally, uh, well, data I talked about, and here's the thing about Texas. We've done a lot of uh, analysis on the Texas top 10% plan, and um, we have a beautiful data system that connects from pre-K to the workforce. California has good data, but it's very separated, right? You might get some good data like Sandy. LA has a good data if they let you use it, right? I've done some analysis with some colleagues, um, but I never saw the data because I didn't have access to it. I just saw the results and then we wrote from there. They use the data. So we were able to do some really interesting analysis on how, how English learners uh, perform from high school into the community college system into transfer. Right? But we can't do it for the whole state because your system isn't integrated yet, say, the way Texas is. Washington also has beautiful data. So thinking about if all, there are also going to be limitations to the level of data quality based on who you are as a state and how can you make it better. And then, of course, language. And this is something we all need to keep learning. I constantly make mistakes and I ask for forgiveness. Um, there's a lot of talk like, why should I care about, you know, I'm just gonna call them he because he looks like a he to me. And well, you know how that debate goes. And the thing is, you know, it's okay to apologize. It's okay to like say, what is it that you need me to do to make you feel more welcome? Because your outcomes, your success matters than my discomfort of not knowing what to do. It just, it just does. Thinking about what's happened with COVID, with what we know, and also bringing in other sectors, I think this is a real opportunity to reset and redesign, especially given what might happen with the Supreme Court. We have to be more creative and innovative. We have to contend with inequality, but work as a community for a future of a community. And I'll keep saying this is, it's, it's gonna get uglier before it gets better but keep thinking it's a time to redesign opportunity in this country. And we have to do it as a multiracial coalition. No negotiation on that. We have to be a multiracial coalition and multi other things too. Okay, thank you.